on behalf of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute. And thank you all for joining us today at the University of the West Indies to help us at the Salises celebrate the memory, legacy, and purpose lives life of a Caribbean icon, a legendary economist, and a critical Black decolonial activist, Sir William Arthur Lewis. I am Dr. Patricia Northover, a development economist and senior research fellow at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute. We proudly bear the name and legacy of Sir Arthur Lewis after a merger of the Institute of Social and Economic Research, which was founded in 1947, and the Consortium Graduate School at the turn of the 21st century. Today would mark the 109th Earth Day of Arthur Lewis, as the Rastafarians would define or enter into this world. But it was a world then that would have been still defined by the ugly oppression of a blatant racial colonial capitalism. Nonetheless, under the protective custody of two devoted parents, teachers from the island of Antigua, he was ushered onto the lovely Caribbean island of St. Lucia as their fourth out of five sons. Today, we are joined by Professor Jayati Ghosh from the University of Massachusetts Am Amsterst, Amherst to discuss our present development conundrums in light of Lewis's own critical development agenda, we spoke to the developing countries of the world, from the Caribbean and Latin America to Africa, Asia, and even the Pacific. To support our proceedings in the question and answer section after the talk, questions should be placed in the chat and persons may raise their hands for permission to make a comment. Please refrain from comments that may be deemed disrespectful. Persons who are held to be disruptive of the session will be removed. Your presence in this session indicates your permission for the recording and also your acceptance of the use of the recorded content on our university website and our Celice's YouTube channel. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our directors at Salises, who will offer opening remarks and introduce our esteemed guest lecturer, the eminent feminist and radical development economist. But before I do so, please allow me to briefly note some landmarks in the life of Sir Arthur Lewis. So Arthur Lewis is well recognized as an economist, but he's also a social and political thinker. Recognized as a pioneer of development economics for his work on economic growth, international economic history, and industrial development. He was a professor of economics at Manchester and Princeton University. He's the first and only Black to receive the Nobel Prize Laureate in Economics, which was done in 1979 and shared with Theodore Schultz. He is the first Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies from 1960 to 63, and Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, University of Ghana, 1966 to 73. He is the first President of the Caribbean Development Bank and indeed its founder, in 1970 to 1973. He's a champion of decol decolonization, racial justice and reparations as witness in the text, Labor in the West Indies, Birth of a Caribbean Labor Movement, which was written when he was just 23 years old. He received the Nobel Prize for his article on economic development with unlimited supplies of labor which was published in 1954 by the Manchester School. Today dates the 70th anniversary of this essay.
I'd like now to introduce our director at MONA at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute and also our universe director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute. I will begin with Dr. Holger Henke. Dr. Henke is a student of international relations in Caribbean, Caribbean, Europe, US, and Asia. He studies migration, political culture, development, political economy, and has authored and co-edited seven books. He has a long relationship with the Caribbean Studies Association and served as its vice president, its president, and immediate past president. Working in the United States, he was first affiliated with the Caribbean Research Center at Medgar's Evers College, CUNY, and became before becoming a full-time faculty member in the Human Services Program at the Metropolitan College of New York. He subsequently changed into senior academic administration, first at York College, CUNY, and subsequently at Wenzhou Keen University in China. Our dear Professor Don Marshall is the University Director of the Sir Arthur Lewis. So we have directors on all three campuses and Dr. Henke is the Director at Mona Campus, whereas Professor Marshall is the Director at Cavill Campus, but also the overall university um, head cook and bottle washer. <laughs> so Professor Marshall is based in the Cavill Campus in Barbados, and he holds a PhD in international political economy, and is the author and editor of three books, eight monographs, and several scholarly articles in esteemed journals. Through his work, he critiques Anglo-American globalization and conceives of globalizations locating the Caribbean development problematic within such an imaginary and argues that alternative sustainable futures are possible. Professor Marshall sits on the editorial boards of key international journals, such as the University of Helsinki Globalizations, the University of London's Progress in Development Studies, and the University of the West Indies flagship journal, the Journal of Eastern Caribbean Studies. His research interests are also linked to issues centered on globalization development. We'll now follow our program, which will see Dr. Henke bringing welcome and opening remarks, followed by Dr. Professor Marshall, who will introduce our keynote speaker, um, Professor Gosh. Gentlemen, the floor is over to you, Dr. Henke. Thank you, Dr. Northover, and greetings uh, from all of us at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, affectionately known by its acronym SALESIS. Uh, at the University of the West Indies. It is my very great pleasure to welcome all of you online to our recognition of Sir Arthur Lewis during this year's Sir Arthur Lewis Day that we're recognizing at the Institute. Sir Arthur was born back in 1915 on this very day, 109 years ago. Salesis strives to continue his legacy by its work as a research and graduate teaching institution in the Faculty of Social Sciences, which produces high quality research on issues of the region's social and economic opportunities and challenges. We also advise regional governments and policymakers and offer masters and PhD programs in development studies. I believe it is fair to say that in many fundamental ways, the issues that exercise Lewis's economic mind are in some form and shape still with us today. I recently came across an article about his work published in 2019, just before the COVID pandemic struck the globe. In that article, Dr. Mark Figueroa pointed out that Lewis's attempt to understand the Caribbean in the context of the global dynamics of the world economy was one of his strengths. Specifically, 
there uh, is a footnote that struck a deep chord with me and which I want to center and highlight as we are about to hear this keynote lecture. In this footnote, Dr. Figueroa points out the social scientific analog to the Copernican principle in cosmology that Lewis applies in his study. And he writes, I quote, in cosmology, the Copernican principle posits that human observers are not privileged in terms of space and time. Humans are measured on the one meter scale, but much of what affects their existence needs to be observed at a much smaller, for example, viruses, or larger, for example, weather systems scale. We make profound errors, Dr. Figueroa says, when we do not recognize that much of what is important to us needs to be understood in terms of processes which are rooted in other places and times and which occur at speeds much slower or faster than those at which we operate. He concludes by saying we are not at the center of the universe nor central to the driving forces of many things which determine our circumstances. And so I'm always intrigued when indigenous people, for example, the Australian Aborigines, a people who look back on an almost uninterrupted history of at least 10,000 years, when they use phrases like a little long while, to describe the passage of a certain period of time. How appropriate, don't you think? It is also very apropos that this year we are able to hear a keynote lecture from an esteemed and internationally well-known economist, Professor Jayati Ghosh, who will actually address us all the way from India where she's currently visiting. I'm very pleased that Professor Marshall who is based in Barbados, uh, will now introduce Professor Ghosh. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, once I'm being received, Dodon Clare, I think I can confidently say on behalf of the entire Salises family, extending to those within the wider University of the West Indies, uh, welcome to our space virtually. Welcome, Professor Jetty. Gosh, um, one of the most intriguing things about your distinguished career is not simply the many awards and prizes of one and the, the um, many places and positions that you've held at various universities, including Tufts University and Cambridge University. Um, but I want to put an accent, uh, given the honor that you have of delivering this, this lecture um, uh, with at a time when we are honoring also Sir Arthur Lewis, I want to put the emphasis on you know, your role uh, within the International Development Economics Associates ideas. Uh, you are known by many, most of your colleagues as one of the economists around the world, very much critical of mainstream economic, the mainstream economic paradigm of neoliberalism. And um, I find this very intriguing because Arthur Lewis himself, although uh, in some quarters seen as one of the um, mon modernization theorists, as it were, uh, there are a number of radical departures that um, he undertook when he was looking at the whole question of addressing underdevelopment and unemployment in the what was then called and referred to as the British West Indies. I see that you work not within the the the, the wings of of, of 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 the court of neoliberalism where there's a gentle debate uh, going on. I see you are prepared to look at issues of the existential threat that climate change poses, and indeed see the limitations inherent with slavishly following the neoliberal paradigm of how to organize one's political economy, how to organize one's society and economies indeed. And um, this is what draws 
you know, most of us to uh, your work, your your example. You are the principal. You were the principal author of the West Bengal Human Development Report, which has received the United Nations Development Program Praise for Excellence in Analysis. And uh, we also are aware of the many articles that you've written uh, for various publics appearing in regular columns on economics and current affairs for Frontline Magazine, Business Line, the Bengali newspaper, um, Ganashaki, I, I hope I've pronounced that well, Deccan Chronicle and Asian Age. And we know that you continue to be a regular columnist for the fortnightly national magazine Frontline. And while you focus mainly on economic issues, I think it is fair to say, Professor Gosh, that you are very much wedded to uh, the whole project of well-being, the whole project of well-being, and uh, trying to square or bring together the ecological and economic nexus of how you secure human security, uh, species security, uh, and you know well-being within. Uh, a world uh, undergoing uh, rapid climate change. And addition, in addition to your academic work, I want to also acknowledge for our audiences here, live, uh, in person, and virtually, uh, that you serve on several advisory boards, uh, particularly some global governance organizations like the World Health Organization's uh, Council on the, economic, on the Economics of Health for All. Um, You've been a member of the commission since the Commission for Universal Health since um, 2022, and this was convened by Chatham House. And you also co and it's also co-chaired by colleagues Helen Clark and Jakaya Kikwete. And since uh, 2022, you've been a part of the Joint World Bank WHO Global Prepare Preparedness Monitoring Board. This puts you, Professor Gosh, in. A, in an ideal kind of place and space to address the very topic that you've designed for this talk, economic dualism, employment and development in the era of climate change. And we are intrigued as small island developing states uh, and, all, and as countries um, with, if not plantation origins, plantation society effects and, uh, and, and racialized pasts. Uh, we are very much intrigued to hear how you would address the whole um, point of the development challenges that we face today uh, in light of climate change. Welcome and God's blessings to you. Thank you so much, Professor Marshall, for that heartfelt introduction of Professor Jaya Tegosh, um, eminent um, critical academic who makes the rounds on talk shows, news programs, um, hundreds of articles, books. I mean, when I read the CV, I was just, oh my God, <laughs> overwhelmed. <laughs> but as a, as a woman, another black woman in a different space, I was encouraged as well. So Professor Gosh, the floor is over to you. Well, thank you so much. I cannot begin to describe the extreme privilege I feel. I mean, I feel so honored to be delivering this lecture because uh, I suppose like all of you, it's not just in the West Indies. Everywhere in the world, people in the developing world have grown up with Arthur Lewis's work. And uh, as an economist, of course, I was, you know, relating to it in different ways all the time. And I do want to uh, emphasize something that um, both uh, Holger and, and uh, Professor Marshall actually mentioned that, you know, th there's much more to it than the standard dualism stuff that uh, is often seen as the, the sort of important aspect of his work. I'm thinking of the evolution of the international economy. I'm thinking of all the work that recognizes dependency and, and the criticality of that in the nature of the West Indies development experience and a lot of things like that, which have, I think, affected and impacted all of us in many different ways. So for me, it is a huge honor and I really am grateful to you all for inviting me to deliver this lecture. And thank you also for this uh, very uh, excessive introduction, actually, which um, I, I don't really deserve, but I'll take it. 
So let me share my screen. And um, okay, I need to bring us back up to the beginning. Uh, there we go. Yes. I hope this is visible, the screen. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is, uh, in a sense, the title is a little bit misleading. I'm not really going to focus on any one country, and I'm not going to focus on the internal dynamics of the country. I'm really, because climate change is so global, and because the impacts are felt so strongly across the world, but especially in your part of the world, I'm really going to focus on the global context and implications of this and how it plays out in terms of the possibilities for development, the very thing that uh, Professor Arthur Lewis spent so much of his life uh, engaging with. So essentially what I'm going to argue with is that, I mean, if you're looking at in terms of the, the basic challenge we face, I would argue it's a very different challenge from the one that uh, Sir Arthur Lewis can, uh, faced way back in the, um, excuse me for a moment, I just have to, it's a very different challenge from the one that was faced by uh, the, um, the development economists of the mid 20th century, because we have a problem with many of the, uh, uh, we have many of the traditional problems that they were addressing and that uh, uh, Arthur Lewis, for example, uh, addressed particularly, but we have new ones as well. So unfortunately, we still have what you could call the traditional tasks of development. And we still have the traditional constraints of development as well. Our project is still incomplete. I love the phrase that you have just used, the, the project of well-being, because that's really what it is. And it's human and natural and planetary well-being that is now our project. It is very incomplete. And we have the older forms, but they are the older problems, but they now have new forms. And these forms have been created by the fact that economic processes have changed, economies have evolved, differential movements have occurred. The international architecture creates new manifestations of the problems that were identified earlier. But also we have new challenges. And particularly climate change is is such an extreme challenge, it, it is, as was mentioned earlier, an existential challenge, which is even undermining some of the earlier progress that has been made and complicating many of the responses that we can provide. In fact, I, I'm, I know that I'm preaching to an audience that knows this better than I do, because these are concerns that are much more acute in small island developing states. I won't say only in uh, these uh, small island developing states, because even in my own country, India, where I am now, we are facing many of these. We already have climate refugees from many parts of the country. We're already facing desertification. We're already facing rising sea levels in coastal areas. And many of the extreme problems that are emerging in your part of the world are also evident in ours and are not just impeding the project of well-being, but are actually in some cases even reversing it. Now, the challenge is bigger because it is, as I mentioned, a global situation, but and it obviously requires international cooperation, but it requires urgent policy responses, it requires flexible responses, and it requires cooperation. Unfortunately, as we all know, very little of that seems to be evident. In fact, almost nothing is evident at the moment. So let's look at the earlier problems, if you like, the problems that we knew about, the, pro the 20th century problems of the development project, which were highlighted. And I think it's fair to say that economic dualism, specifically the continued existence of surplus labor, the fact that we have not managed to shift workers enough workers to higher value added activities, whether in industry or modern services, uh, that you know we haven't ensured that major transition which leads economies and countries to become developed or industrialized and so on. That is a continuing problem. And that's a problem I believe in, in your part of the world, but certainly also in South Asia, certainly in large parts of the developing world. On top of that, many countries and many parts of particular countries have this legacy of the plantation economy. I actually 
read uh, Lloyd Best and Carrie Polanyi's uh, Levitt's uh, book as part of preparing for this lecture at the um, instigation, I should say, of uh, Holge Henke. And um, it's really, uh, it's really extraordinary how it fits into not just the West Indian situation, but very much the Indian situation, very much many developing countries in Africa, uh, many lower and uh, middle income countries in across the world. Because this impact of mercantilist economic policy of the metropolitan countries, the fact that we had experienced patterns of extraction and exploitation that didn't benefit our economies, but were designed to benefit the colonial economy, that legacy persists in many, many different ways. And that, of course, is part of the essential problem that has been identified. The, you know, Still, I, I'm referring to it as a 20th century problem, but it's very much a 21st century problem as well. It hasn't gone away. And what has that legacy of the plantation economy meant? First of all, excessive reliance on primary goods exports and extraction. So it could be mineral, it could be agricultural, but basically it's export-led growth. We're not looking for the domestic demand uh, and we're not looking at rising wages, generating higher demand domestically. We are looking at the export possibilities of extraction. This extraction in turn is heavily dependent on foreign capital, on investment essentially by multinational corporations that uh, is designed, of course, to maximize their own profits, but also to maximize the extraction with relatively less regard for the longer term sustainability implications. This has meant that quite often we lack even the most essential uh, production required for domestic consumption, such as food. And so food imports becomes another aspect of extreme dependence and of concern in many of our countries, and I believe also in the West Indies as well. Along with this, we have the fact that the value added of exports tends to be much lower than those of our imports that we are at the receiving end of the global value chain, whereby we deliver the lower value chain parts of production and we receive the higher value chain parts of production. Now, all of this in turn means that, you know, we basically persist in our low wage development and there are therefore limitations on the growth of the domestic market. And that in turn means you don't get the benefits of economies of scale and so on. And of course, infrastructure development is inadequate. It's designed to facilitate the export extraction rather than generate a sort of holistic, sustainable growth pathway across our whole, econ whole economy. So that generates what you would call structural balance of payments deficits, along with a domestic combination, which is really weird. It's a combination of particular supply shortages as well as demand constraints. And so this is a um, pattern that definitely arose for long historical reasons, but it persisted through the 20th century. It persists in the 21st century. It hasn't gone away. And I think that's really the biggest challenge in a way. But of course, as I said, it's a challenge that is now further added on to by new developments in the global economy. So yes, there's primary product extraction, but increasingly tourism has become yet another method of surplus extraction by the metropolitan uh, corporations. And I want to emphasize that a lot of this is still FDI driven. A lot of this is still determined and driven by capital from the metropolis with all of the implications that existed even for the extractive industries. And uh, that means that even the kinds of services that we export, and particularly the tourism ex uh, services that we export, keep us once again at the bottom end of the smiley curve. The smiley curve is, a, is something that has been used to describe global value chains, whereby the value added happens all at the pre-production and post-production parts of the curve. Uh, and the actual production, the people, the workers, the ones who are actually producing those goods and services, they get very low value. And this is true, it's as true of, uh, you know, the iPhones produced by Foxconn, where they get 10% of the final value of the good, 
as it is for tourism services or for cash crops produced in the West Indies. We are remain at that lower end of the smiley curve. And then we have new forms of dependency, new dimensions that are created by cross-border financial flows. And these are expressed in many ways. There's, of course, the fact of external debt, the repayment burdens imposed by external debt, the legacy debt that continues to plague countries uh, very dramatically. And then, of course, the fact that capital flows are extremely volatile. And they're volatile often for reasons that have nothing to do with the performance of the country concerned. They have to do with macroeconomic policies of the North, of the advanced economies, which generate the capital coming in when the monetary policy is lax and interest rates are low, or capital flowing out when monetary policy tightens and interest rates get higher. I mentioned that there is now an international legal architecture which reinforces many unequal processes. And uh, we can talk about this perhaps in the dis discussion, but it is really, uh, I would argue, these are newer impediments to the possibilities for development. The World Trade Organization and various free trade agreements, CAFTA in your case, for example, and the rules on trade that they impose dramatically reduce the policy space uh, for autonomous development in a lot of lower income countries. Uh, the intellectual property regimes that are um, typically uh, now increasingly and heavily enforced on the developing world are again major impediments to the possibilities of autonomous development. The ways in which sovereign debt legacies are dealt with, the enforcement of extremely unequal and frankly unacceptable rules, things that would not be accepted within the economies of the global north, within the United States, within UK, they have bankruptcy laws that prevent this kind of really excessive extraction based on so debt. Those are not available to sovereign debtors who, and many of our countries are suffering from this. And then, of course, the uh, arbiters of um, global economic policy, the IMF and the World Bank, have an unfortunate emphasis on austerity, on fiscal cutbacks to address any situation, even when the problem is not caused by fiscal excesses. They go out there and impose austerity. Uh, within this rather bleak picture, it, there is this further problem that is faced particularly by small island development states. And once again, I think I'm sure I'm saying things that you already know far too well. The fact that your geography means that you can't really get economies of scale for infrastructure projects because these tend to be large. An airport, for example, uh, or you know, various different kinds of transport linkages. So economies of scale becomes a concern. Then, of course, there's the David versus Goliath problem, the fact that all countries that are relatively small in size Typically, we're all facing multinational corporations that are huge, that are many times the total GDP. And it's not just the economic size, it's the marketing power, market power and the lobbying capacity with our governments, which makes it a very unequal relationship in terms of the terms on which investment occurs and the terms on which our primary products, our minerals, our agricultural commodities are extracted. Climate change, I don't have to tell you about. It's already affecting us in rising sea levels in the severity and frequency of extreme events like hurricanes and floods. Now, all of this, of course, they affect human life and animal life and plant life, but they also affect economic activity. And that's, so it becomes yet another, not just impediment, but often a reversal of the development project. And that's something which, is not adequately factored in into anything, into financial uh, strategies, into public policies, into longer term government investment. We simply are not doing enough of that. But what it does do is increase risk perceptions. And of course, all of us are already at the bottom of the ladder in terms of risk perception, even when we, we are very good in terms of economic policy, even when we um, obey all of the commandments that are you know, sent down by the IMF and World Bank, etc. It doesn't help us. The private sector continues to be, in fact, not in spite of, often because of, because those are often anti-development 
kinds of um, strategies, uh, private sector tends to have very high risk and they tend to require huge incentives to uh, do any kind of investment. And meanwhile, public investment is very constrained for fiscal reasons, for reasons of high debt, legacy debt, and for concerns about running large fiscal deficits. So these are the problems. But now I want to get a little bit more into the, the global context, because I think that's very important. And I'm going to call this context climate imperialism. And I know that often when somebody puts these words together there, it's seen as problematic that, you know, you're talking about imperialism, isn't that sort of over and done with? Aren't we post-imperialist? And I would argue, unfortunately, no. If we define imperialism, not in the ways that of people often think of it in terms of colonization and so on, but rather as the struggle of large capital, typically monopolistic capital over economic territory, as a struggle that is actively aided and assisted by the relevant states then imperialism is unfortunately alive and well and exercising its impact on all of us. So what is economic territory? It's many different things. Of course, there's land. Yes, everybody knows about land, about resources extracted from nature, whether you know below the soil or above the soil and so on, water, labor, both paid and unpaid labor. I think it's important to recognize the significance of unpaid labor of markets, of often newly commoditized services that were earlier typically seen as something that governments provided, whether it's electricity or it's education or even security. These were seen as things that were part of public provision. Increasingly, they are being privatized. And even if they're not privatized, they're commercialized. Governments expect to get you know, value back for providing these. Another new form of economic territory is knowledge which you know, is, is, is frankly almost obscene in the way in which intellectual property is now compartmentalized, privatized, commercialized, and seen as an arena for profit, which I believe uh, actually inhibits the further dissemination of knowledge. But now we know that even cyberspace is economic territory that can be contested and is contested. But these are all different forms. I would argue that today, perhaps one of the strongest forms of imperialism is climate imperialism, because it's the one which is now impacting all of us. And it is also the most strongly associated with coercion, with conflict, with wars, as well as legal and economic architecture. And that's important. You know, the legal architecture often doesn't appear to be coercive. It seems that, oh, well, you know, it's just the rules of the game, it's laws, you need those. In fact, they are deeply coercive and deeply unequal. These are strong statements, and so I know I'm going to have to justify them. So let's uh, get on with this. So what is it now about climate imperialism? How is it expressed? Well, essentially what it means is that the metropolitan countries and the global elites which means the, the wealthy across the world, not just the wealthy living in the US and Europe and Japan and so on, but the wealthy even living in, our, in India, in China, in Brazil, in South Africa, in, across the world. Uh, they are able to have patterns of production and consumption that are based on extraction and on exploitation of the conditions of others, an imperialist mode of living, okay? So they are able to generate increasing global carbon emissions, very high and rising ecological footprints because of the inequality that is generated. But meanwhile, the international negotiations actually address climate change in very unequal and deceptive and debilitating ways. And I believe that the COPs which are seen as this global coming together, et cetera, they, are ex they express that inequality. They express the deceptions that are inherent. And I'm going to talk about how. Meanwhile, we know that both global finance and the governments of major countries, the subsidies that they provide increase carbon emissions. Okay, the subsidies going to uh, fossil fuels, the IMF estimates that if you count direct and indirect subsidies, it's approaching six trillion. That's the kind of number we're talking about, six trillion per year. 
And for the US alone, it, it was 700 billion per year in 2022. So enormous subsidies provided. And of course, private finance follows this. Private finance provides huge resources for fossil fuel investments and for brown investments, even while paying lip service to you know, ESG and, and doing green finance and so on. Meanwhile, the required finance for you know, mitigation strategies or adaptation or loss and damage, despite the declaration of a loss and damage fund, despite all the talk about how mitigation is essential, the money that is being provided is laughable. I will show you some numbers. Meanwhile, in fact, the intellectual property rights, the knowledge monopolies created by the, this terrible regime of intellectual property rights are are extremely worrying because most of humankind now cannot access the critical technologies that we need to confront the climate challenge. And that's a huge concern that is going to become even more important because as I said, now it's upon us. The problem is urgent. We can no longer say it's going to happen in the future. And then bad enough that you know we don't get the technologies we need to do something about this, but the new technologies that are emerging and are very important, they require new minerals. And so we are getting new resource grabs, particularly aimed at strategic minerals, whether it is lithium or it is the rare earths. And so there are new forms of extractivist competition among the leading powers. There are strategies that are supposed to address this, carbon markets, carbon capture and storage, geoengineering, etc. They all have their own problems. They all have limitations. They're, so far, carbon markets have been almost completely ineffective. Carbon capture and storage is often treated by large business as they opt out, that, that, that they don't have to do other stuff if they can say they're doing carbon capture and storage. So they are problematic in different ways. And of course, the way in which we have chosen to deal with this as humanity is frankly weird, okay? Because let's face it, it's a global problem. It doesn't recognize borders and passports and visas and so on, right? Yet we persist in treating it as something that has to be engaged with at the national political level and at the national economic policy level. So how does it work? Uh, countries are assigned climate responsibility uh, based on current national ambitions. These then form the basis of climate uh, negotiations. I'm sorry, this should have not been COP26, but COP28 that we've just had in a major fossil fuel exporting country. But this, of course, ignores historic responsibility. It ignores carbon debt. And so it understates the responsibility of richer countries. And that... In turn, it also overstates the incomes of poorer countries because it uses purchasing power parity measures of income rather than the actual exchange rates, the market exchange rates that we all face. And that overstates poor country income. It's also that the measures that are used are based on production rather than consumption. Yet we know that the North continues to export a lot of its carbon intensive production and that this has actually been a major source whereby it can claim less responsibility for the carbon emissions that it is doing. Now, I said that they ignore the historical debt. Here is one estimate of the historical debt, which is uh, from the mid 19th century to the first decade of this century. And as you can see, a very small part of the world, today they come to about 14% of global population, were responsible for nearly 80% of cumulative carbon emissions. So really the rich and the advanced economies with a tiny proportion of the global population have been disproportionately responsible for the mess we're in. Now you could say, well, wait a minute, you know, nobody in the mid 19th century knew that carbon was a problem. Nobody knew that global warming was a concern. So we can't get after people who did things well before they were recognized to be problems. Well, the trouble is that in fact, more than half of these emissions occurred in the last 30 years, when in fact it was all known, when everybody knew that global warming was a problem, every, everyone knew that fossil fuel emissions are a problem. And yet, in fact, more than half of the emissions occurred 
in this latest 30 year period. This, by the way, this graph doesn't even talk about the emissions uh, of the colonies. In other words, the fact this is all production based. And yet we know that this 14% of the world also benefited from emissions in their colonies, which they instigated and created. So in fact, the responsibility is even greater. Yet we also know that if you're looking at the likely impacts, the worst affected are going to be the countries that didn't contribute now uh, to uh, the problem. In fact, mostly the countries that contributed to the problem uh, have hardly any impact or they don't, they're not going to get a decline in GDP at all. That's a large part of Europe, Canada, et cetera. But, and even the United States, it's a relatively low impact for climate change. And yet the Caribbean region, African region, large part of Latin America, large, all, all of South Asia and Southeast Asia, we are disproportionately impacted in terms of the likely GDP losses. What is even worse, and this data here is from the climate inequality report that came out just uh, last year. It, what this shows is how, uh, this is now in terms of the shares of global population rather than the, um, the regional or geographical spread. But as you can see, uh, and disproportionately, you know, South Asia, the Caribbean, et cetera, we are in the bottom 50% or some of us in the middle 40%, okay? We're not in the top 10%. But anyway, if you're looking at the capacity to finance versus the losses, the losses are likely, it, they're concentrated in the bottom half of the population. 75% of the losses are going to hit the bottom half of the population, okay? Whereas the top 10% will only experience 3% of the losses and the middle will get 20%. The emissions of the bottom half are only 12% of global emissions. The emissions of the top 10% are around half of global emissions. And of course, if you look at wealth, because this is a useful indicator, wealth gives you some indication of the capacity to finance either mitigation or adaptation or loss and damage. There's really no capacity to finance in the bottom 50%. There's very relatively little in the middle 40%. But it's concentrated, more than three fourths of the capacity to finance is concentrated in the top 10%. In, in other words, the problem is about inequality. And the inequality is not only ge geographical because we have rich people also in our own countries. It's really about the concentration of income and wealth, which is driving climate change. But also because of that concentration, the capacity to solve it, the finances for that also exist among that top group. And what's interesting is that this is true across the regions, okay? And so as you can see here, um, and the Caribbean, by the way, I'm sorry, is included in Latin America. But as you can see, the bottom 50% has got relatively low per capita emissions. But the top 10% has got pretty high per capita in admissions in every region, uh, much higher even, for, even uh, for example, you look at East, East and Southeast Asia, or you look at um, these other countries, you find that the emissions of the top 10% are higher than even the bottom 50% in the rich countries. So it's an, the issue of inequality is even significant within countries. It's not just about the geographical inequality. As I've said, you know, six, about two thirds of carbon emissions is due to within country inequality, but we could actually solve this problem by reducing inequality therefore. For example, if you want to lift the entire world's population above the global poverty line that the World Bank has identified, Global carbon emissions would only increase by 5%. That's nothing, okay? However, the top 10%, as I said, it's around half of global emissions. The top 1% are around 15% of global emissions, 
Now, if you actually did a very low wealth tax, just one and a half percent tax on wealth of the centi-millionaires, centi-millionaires are those with personal assets of more than 100 million, you would get $290 billion per year. Here we are desperately trying to generate funds, and yet we are unable to do so. Yet a tiny wealth tax, which would not be noticed by these people who have more than 100 million in wealth, that would actually generate nearly 300 billion. This is in the context where current estimates of adaptation for the low and middle income countries is around 202 billion per year. So we would happily cover that if we actually did impose a wealth tax on centimillionaires. The other point I want to make, though, is something that, you know, is is often misunderstood in many of our countries, which is that we have to choose between development poverty reduction on the one hand and climate mitigation on the other. You know, that if we actually do this thing of moving away from fossil fuels and we can't do development, we'll have all these poor people. That's not true. OK, we can choose a development pattern that at one level improves the energy efficiency of the economy. Uh, overall, all your activities use less energy. We can change the investment and consumption towards activities that require less energy. And within energy, we can go from the, the worst, uh, which is coal and petroleum and so on, to we can move up that ladder to natural gas, to clean renewables like solar and wind and hydro sources as well. Okay. Of course, that means we need to change urbanization patterns. But, you know, that's actually better for concerned economies and then continuing with the current patterns, because the current pattern is actually a doom loop. It's actually a disaster. And it's, it's not just disaster. It would be catastrophic. So we, we have to do something. There have been estimates. My colleague Bob Polin and Noam Chomsky did a study that you could actually do this with, a, you know, between one and a half and two and a half percent of GDP of the large economies, only the large economies. But of course, it's not just finance that we know. We need access to technology as well, as I have mentioned. But let's look at the finance. You know, they promised, the developed countries in 2012 promised that they would give 100 billion per year for climate finance. So far, it's less than 67 billion, even in the most, the most recent period. And it's not from individual countries, it's from multilateral sources, regional development banks, and so on. But even this is an overestimate because there's still no official definition of what is climate finance. So you can count anything in climate finance, all sorts of things. Uh, there was an investigation by Reuters that found that, you know, Italy provided a subsidy to open chocolate and gelato stores across Asia. The U.S. did coastal hotel expansion in Haiti. Belgium did a love story set in Singapore, a film of a love story, because it's set in a rainforest. It becomes climate investment. Japan financed a new coal plant in Bangladesh, supposedly green coal, and airport expansion in Egypt. Now, it's one thing that they financed this, but it's another thing that they called it green finance for climate. That's the killer. And as I've already told you, meanwhile, there are these huge subsidies for fossil fuels and private finance directed towards brown investment. Now, the other aspect that I remember that I wanted to highlight in this context is that of debt, because this is really, uh, I can't call it an elephant in the room because everyone's talking about it. It's not something that is unnoticed, but it is huge and it is a, a major and pressing problem. Now, um, the international community, if you like, you know, the Davos crowd, they've stopped bothering about debt because there's no, very few countries are going into actual default. Uh, but the uh, countries that are going into default are small enough not to impact the global economy. So they don't really care. Okay. Yet, in fact, more than half of low income countries are in high risk of debt distress or already in debt distress. There are middle income countries that have already defaulted or are facing really severe debt stress. We've had 14 default events across the last one and a half years, which is just one and a half years. And yet, you know, there were 19 for the entire two decades before that. This is not 
uncommon. We've had previous patterns of you know periodic explosions of debt distress, largely because of the policies of the rich countries. It's the macroeconomic policies of rich countries that cause capital to flow out and so on. What is really intriguing and I would say concerning is that the countries of uh, the middle and low income countries, the so-called fundamentals don't apply to them. You know, what's a, what is a, a fundamental supposed to be? Let's say the level of your debt to GDP. Yeah, or uh, how much debt service to GDP. Those are supposed to be the things that creditors and, and financiers would look at. But look at the left side of this chart. The advanced economies have huge general government debt to GDP levels, okay? In excess of 100%, went up massively during the COVID-19 pandemic, came down a little bit, but still very, very high in 112% in 2023. The middle income countries were much more circumspect. It stayed within 70%. It went up a little bit during the COVID-19 pandemic, increased a little bit, but still very moderate increase. In fact, they were very restrained. They did not spend more. And that means they denied their citizens their basic needs during the pandemic and the health crisis and the economic crisis that followed. But the low income countries, it's truly shocking. Very low debt to GDP ratios, less than half, and did not budge barely changed at all over this whole period of crisis. Now you would think if they're being so fiscally disciplined, if they're being so well behaved and good, that they would be rewarded by the capital markets for their efforts. I mean, they're denying their own citizens, their basic social and economic rights to be in good faith with the capital markets, right? So are they being rewarded? Well, now look at the right-hand graph. This is the spread on sovereign debts over the between 2018 and 2023. And as you can see, the blue line is advanced economies. This is the spread over the US federal rate. Okay. How the spread is less than 1%. It's 0.1%. So and it has not budged. It has stayed the same. This is the average spread. Look what's happened to middle and low-income countries. It just ballooned. So here they are being excessively fiscally disciplined, behaving themselves, so-called, and yet the spread on the sovereign debt is just going through the roof, which dramatically increases borrowing costs. So this is, it goes up to 700 basis points, okay? Which is, you know, like a 7% spread over the US Fed rate. And for some low-income countries and debt-stressed countries, they went up to 11% over the US Fed rate for the bonds which of course it massively increases your borrowing costs and it makes it much more difficult for you to access new debt. And it's happening even though you are doing so-called what is supposed to be done. Now, in fact, the small island developing countries face particular types of debt problems. Now, more than 40% are in or on the brink of debt distress because of this upsurge. And it's not just even the ones that are not close to default. The point is that the debt service counts for around one third of government revenues, more than double of all the spending on health, education, and social protection together. Just imagine. And in many of these small island developing countries, the disasters that have happened in the recent past uh, have increased massively. So the damage has increased by nearly 90%, the impact. Okay, private ex and, and when you have these major disasters, then your debt increases because you're unable to repay. That gets add out, added on to the principal. This has recently happened to Guyana, to the Dominican Republic. And this is at the same time that concessional aid is declining. Now, the minute you have structural vulnerability, you have a high debt burden, you have a legacy debt, and you have all of these other things added to the higher risk perceptions, investors back away. And when they back away, risk perceptions get even higher and credit ratings fall even further. So it's a vicious downward cycle that is driven by these private credit markets. The other big problem, and I think it's a problem also in the Caribbean now, is the instability in food prices, which has generated food insecurity in large parts of the developing world. So that, for example, you know, uh, Caribbean agriculture, as we all very well know, the plantation economy, it's 
doesn't generate food for the domestic market. It's sugar, bananas, things like that for export. And we have seen that there was a dramatic upsurge in global food prices during the Ukraine war, not because of the war, but because companies made profits off that. Uh, the supplies remained the same, but they made profits uh, by declaring that you know the war would impact on supplies and financial speculation in the commodities market, which caused prices to go up massively for about six months before they came down again. But for net food importing countries, two things happened. One is that, of course, immediately when the prices go up globally, they impact on the domestic price, as you can see here. Uh, for some of these countries, the massive increase in prices in 2020 and 2021. But even after that, when the global price comes down, your currency is depreciating because of capital outflow, because of the monetary policy tightening in the US and Europe, because of higher risk perceptions, because of those bond market spreads that I showed you. And so you see this dramatic and really incredibly high increase in food price inflation across the Caribbean countries. Today, in fact, the cost of a healthy diet is one of the highest in the world in the Caribbean. $4.4 per person per day in purchasing per parity terms. Now that's more than 40% higher than the average in the OECD. It is 13% higher than the lower middle income countries and it's 5% higher than small island development countries as a whole. So the Caribbean is particularly badly placed in terms of food insecurity. And lack of food sovereignty has been worsened uh, by the fact that you know climate change is adding to all the difficulties of generating more domestic food production. Now what all of this means is that we have to rethink a development strategy that you know uh, creates uh, that suggests false solutions. One of the big solutions that is suggested, and I regret to say it is also something that the IMF and the World Bank regularly suggest, is more debt. That the way to get out of the debt is to take on more debt. This is a Ponzi finance trap. It never ends well. It's, you know, borrowing to repay earlier loans is, is a mess. You really, when, when they become unpayable, you simply have to restructure the debt. You simply have to get into debt relief. It is not going to solve your problem to take on more debt, push the can on the, down the road and have that can growing bigger and bigger. Similarly, when there's a temporary shortage of necessities and you're trying to reduce the impact of that by maintaining a high exchange rate, again, by accumulating more debt, that too doesn't help. That also creates future problems. Typically, what all of our countries are told is that the only way you can get more foreign uh, investment, which you desperately need, and more foreign capital is by liberalizing your capital markets. Well, you know, we've done that. We did that for three decades, and it hasn't helped. It hasn't even helped the middle-income countries, as we've seen. So we have to now look at this and take a very hard look at this foreign investment, look at the benefits, which there are, that you get more foreign exchange, you get technologies, you get markets, but make sure you get those benefits and look at the benefits in relation to the costs, because we know that it carries a huge amount of cost. It, there is a loss of foreign exchange because of the outward remittance of profits, dividend and interest. There's financial speculation and volatility, which often has nothing to do with your own policies. And there's an impact on fiscal space because governments are terrified to spend more in case capital flight occurs. And of course, then there's the other method to attract multinationals, to have tax cuts, to have weak regulation, to provide subsidies. What this does is actually create a race to the bottom for all the developing countries. It doesn't help us. And at the same time, it enables tax avoidance and illicit financial flows that end up costing us much more than the supposed gains. So, what can we do if we can't do all of that? And so here I'm going to very briefly outline some measures that I think are important nationally to cope with the development challenges that I mentioned in the very beginning, okay? So first, reiterating the point I just made, external debt, really we have to be careful about it. We shouldn't just take it because interest rates are lower in some other country. We should take external debt on only 
for those foreign exchange requirements that cannot be financed through current account flows, like merchandise exports or service exports. So only when you desperately need the foreign exchange, not just any finance, should there be foreign debt taken on. And meanwhile, green investments, all the investments we need for sustainable development, et cetera, in domestic currency, we should finance through domestic resource mobilization, particularly better taxation of multinationals and taxes on extreme wealth. And I can elaborate on this. I think it's a very important point and it's something which is inadequately understood in many developing countries, how we are not taxing multinationals, even what we are taxing our domestic companies, and we are not taxing the wealthy when it is an available means of extracting revenue. So we need to also emphasize food sovereignty. And I think that requires proactive policies, not just within a country, but across regions. We need measures to tax the rich and multinationals at fair rates, equivalent to other tax residents. And ideally, regional cooperation would help with that. There is a really strong case for the cancellation of foreign debt especially after major climate shocks. And if it cannot be, if it's not done by the global community, I think there's a case for just saying, well, we're not going to pay it because we have suffered a major climate disaster. Similarly, industrialization is very important. You must have a transformation of the economy through greater industrialization. But we have to recognize that this is no longer going to generate employment in the same way because of new technologies, because of more automation, because of the ways in which industrialization has proceeded. Industrialization is still important. More value added and processing is still important for many reasons, for synergies, for linkages, for knowledge creation, et cetera. But for employment, we have to think of new channels, particularly investment in care and creative industries. The care economy, which has been underinvested in in all of our countries, is a huge source of not just better welfare, better standard of living, better employment for women, but also it's a massively employment high multi uh, high employment multiplier kind of investment. Of course, all of this requires changes in the international economic architecture as well. So, you know, certainly in terms of the climate negotiations, we should be using market exchange rates, not PPP. We should bring in the role of historical carbon debt. And we should consider the shares of future carbon as well, according to the per capita basis. Okay. We need massively increased public climate finance. And this should not be seen as foreign aid, as you know, rich countries be kind to the low income countries and so on. It should be based on global public investment because we know these are global challenges. These are global public bads. We need global public investment. One possible route is using more special drawing rights of the IMF. And of course, using multilateral ba development banks more imaginatively, creatively, and with less conditionality to actually enable these investments. I've already talked about multinational profits and extreme wealth of individuals, uh, the, the need to tax that. There is now a discussion at the United Nations for a tax convention. And this is a great opportunity to actually ensure that we can generate uh, um, some kind of a deal that would enable all of our countries to get our fair share of the taxes from these sources. We need to regulate private finance uh, and control it because it continues to fund the brown projects. Border carbon taxes, which are the policy choice of the European Union and the US are not a solution. They are basically trade protectionism. And especially because, you know, we no longer trust these global collections of revenue when there's no real clear statement about compensation or sharing of revenues. If you have a global tax and dividend policy, which a number of even progressive economists have suggested, that could only work if you have trust and international cooperation. And let's face it, right now we have neither, okay? Now, of course, I once again have to repeat technology sharing new technologies, making them accessible to all, it's essential. So we have to change the IPR regime and TRIPS has to be renegotiated. 
So basically, things can be different. You know, I mean, we need more liquidity like the IMF SDRs. Ideally, we should have selective allocations, not a global allocation so that most of them go to countries that will never use them, but a selective allocation based on principles of need, climate vulnerability, and so on. The current international financial institutions are outdated. Yeah? They're unwieldy, they're slow, they give too little too late, they have terrible conditions. So we need a new institutional structure with equal footing for principal creditors and debtor nations and stronger rules to impose on private creditors. Debtor countries have to cooperate and coordinate strategies to assess the debt sustainability correctly instead of allowing the IMF to give problematic estimates and create a template for a globally implemented policy framework. But also we must have capital controls and internal financial regulation. It's essential because otherwise the global financial markets are creating such fragility, such volatility, and they're reacting to forces that are not of our own policy making. So we really need to protect ourselves from these very, very volatile flows. Bottom line, what do we do? If we know the multilateral system is not going to do this, what do we do? I would argue that we have to have coalitions of developing countries, coalitions of countries that could be issue-based to confront global power, because we cannot do it on our own. But if we join in groups and coalitions, we can actually have a voice that would have to be heard. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Gosh, for that illuminating, comprehensive, exciting um, <laughs> tour of development conundrums focusing on the issues of climate imperialism and the need for joining together in terms of reorganizing our activities to engage with transnational corporations, to articulate our ideas about what the new global financial architecture should be like, and to insist on new terms for regulating the flows of capital as well as the flows of aid that come in the form of unsustainable debt. So quite a mouthful, um, data, visuals were exciting and informative, clear to read and clearly explained. Um, you are a model teacher <laughs> and certainly um, a wonderful presentation all in all. So um, I would open the floor for questions now. Um, one question that I would like perhaps to throw out um, to Professor Gosh, um, in light of that graph on the inequities in climate impacts, um, given emissions and given who is vulnerable to climate shocks in terms of losses, what is the role do you think of this idea of climate reparation? So going outside of the the concept of aid or even climate finance, but talking to this question of reparation. Um, I know that you have uh, are the context of colonialism because that's the framework in which to think about imperialism, but what about the issues in relationship to climate justice in which a concept of reparations could be used to mobilize countries around this new international, if you will, um, global order in the time of climate change. So that will be my question to throw out while we wait for those questions yeah. to pour in on our in our chat. Yes, well, thank, thank you so much, Patricia. I think that's a very important point. And you know, I there is a very, very strong argument for climate reparations. There's no question about it. I mean, analytically, justice, in terms of justice, ethically, it's a very, very strong argument. Geopolitically, it seems almost impossible. But you know, that has been the case for many, many uh, things that we have demanded in the past, which then suddenly eventually also become significant. So I, I believe it's important for us to keep making the case for climate reparations, for generating more noise about it, for creating traction around the idea, recognizing that it's not going to happen soon. It's not going to, I mean, look at the advanced countries. They wouldn't even share vaccines. I mean, there was a vaccine grab of horrific proportions, right, during the COVID. These are not countries that are going to share anything. And they're not countries that can be shamed into guilt, as we've seen, for example, in the current 
bombing of Gaza and the destruction of Gaza and, and the complicity of the West. So we cannot rely on shaming or on facts or on ideas of justice. What do we do in that context? And I really do believe that countries that are uh, deserving of reparations should then make combined unilateral statements about how they are rejecting a large part of their debt because they're seeing this as reparation. Remember, most of this debt is owed to Western banks. It's owed to European and North American banks and other financial institutions. And that is something that um, would impact on them. Now, any country declaring this on its own is going to face a terrible time in the global capital markets. But a combination of countries, and that's why I keep emphasizing the cooperation. I think it's debtor countries really must get together. We see always, we see this fact of the creditors getting together and they all gather together in one room and they're picking on the debtor and forcing the change and so on. We must force the debtor countries to get to, we must suggest that the debtor countries should get together and that they can make actually fairly radical kinds of changes. They can say, well, we're not going to pay this debt. And if they are together as a group, they count for something. An individual Guyana or Jamaica saying we won't pay the debt is too small to matter. They will swat it off like a fly. A significant group of countries getting together and saying we're not paying changes the game. Hmm. Okay. So in light of that comment, one of the questions that has been thrown out by Professor Iris Schober, who is here at the University of the West Indies, um, what role do you see the BRICS playing addressing the inequalities that persist and are exaggerated by the climate change, given your discussion. Um, would the subject of, a of climate change energize this group? And I just wanted to say that Anna Perkins is also a member of the University of West Indies, um, had a question related to that, which was, how do you see these coalitions working to force significant changes in international economics? So they're more or less the same question, but asked in different ways. So yes. we'll, we'll, we'll um, allow you to respond to this question of the tactics and strategies for international mobilization. <laughs> so, you know, the BRICS is an interesting thing because it's also now recently been expanded. But the expansion suggests that the direction is, is slightly different from what many of us had hoped. Yeah, because if the expansion is including a bunch of oil exporting countries that are not known for particularly progressive economic strategies. So, um, the uh, so the expansion of the BRICS is one that uh, makes me think it may be not the most effective way of doing the uh, uh, the uh, the kinds of coalitions I was talking about. I think Brazil, for example, is actually doing very interesting things, and I know Brazil would like to take even its chairpersonship of the G20 to a different kind of level, but I don't think G20 really has much scope left in it. There are too many divisions within it and there are too much, there's, uh, there's too much um, wasted time, shall we say, in the G20. In the BRICS case, I think it would be significant in terms of redirecting the currencies of trade, in terms of enabling more finance for trade credit in particular in terms of providing different routes to avoid sanctions when they occur. So for example, supposing a bunch of Caribbean countries says, we are not going to pay our debt. And then the US says, we're going to impose sanctions on you. We've now seen that it's quite easy to avoid sanctions if you have enough people on your side. <laughs> Russia has shown that very clearly. <laughs> you can actually do quite well. The Russian economy has not suffered at all. I mean, I'm not holding out, I'm not supporting them. I'm just saying it is possible. So BRICS can play all of those kinds of roles, which are quite significant. We're not, I noticed a comment, we are doomed if BRICS is not the answer. No, <laughs> part of the answer. BRICS is not the whole answer. There isn't one answer. BRICS is part of the answer. I mentioned tax cooperation, and just to answer the other question about different forms of cooperation. In Latin America, there is already this attempt. It, start, it was started by the finance minister of Colombia, 
at the time when he was. Right. So the last point you made was in relationship to tax cooperation and the possible example from the um, Columbia um, in terms mm -hmm. of the strategy that they were taking, their finance minister had taken. So I don't know if you wanted to complete that thought before I ask yes, you any I further did. questions. I do. I do. I'm so sorry. I really do. I uh, I want to emphasize that the attempt that has started by the Finance Ministry of Colombia and which is still ongoing is extremely important because it is given the uh, possibilities of tax cooperation, the fact that it's now coming to the UN, that it's being opposed tooth and nail by the OECD countries. It's very important for a coalition of developing countries to say, well, we can do this on a regional level to begin with ourselves. And that gives huge bargaining power within the U UN convention discussions as well. And of course, it also helps all of you. So I think this is something, for example, in the region to that Latin America and Caribbean region can really show the way to the rest of the developing world. So that's what I meant when I said issue based, you know, debtor countries can do a coalition. You can do a different coalition on tax cooperation. You could do a different coalition on financial regulation. Yeah. Okay. All right, then I just wanted to say that there was a comment in the um, chat that was asking you perhaps to reflect on the situation with Guyana that is seeking finance um, simply because they qualify now <laughs> with the inflow of foreign currency in their country. And there doesn't seem to be any attempt to learn from the lessons in Trinidad and Tobago in the 1970s when the country was pressed into accepting loans and um, blindly complied leading to the um, debt trap. But that comment was from Dr. Taimun Stewart, who is also an honorary fellow at the Sorata Lewis Institute. Yes, you know, it is so frustrating to see this over and over again. Guyana is not the only one. I mean, so many countries, they're, they're all congratulated. You know, everybody rushes up and says, oh yes, wonderful, now you've graduated, you can access these markets, shouldn't you be happy? And they're, forced into yet another debt cycle. All the hippie countries that were, had massive debt relief and were doing quite all right. When global uh, finance, you know, the global financial crisis and interest rates were down, they were more or less pushed into massive um, acceptance of more debt. And now most of them are in debt crises yet again. Jamaica, another example, for eight years now, it's been running fiscal deficits it's yes jamaica is a whole new story <laughs> but jamaica has also been seen as a poster child for fiscal prudence which as you noted has been at the extreme cost of human well-being in terms of the investment por portfolios that are needed for social and human development um I just, another question that i'm going to we have around five more minutes for questions yes. um and it's from Doreen from Island City Labs. And she says, I'm curious about the role of labor, labor justice, and the movements as we across the Caribbean are in the race to the bottom, as we vie for the very same set of tourism jobs and business outsourcing jobs. So that is something that is a very important question for the Caribbean region, which is seen as a low cost um. Um, easily extractable um, labor la labor zone. Yes, that's, that's exactly what I was saying about how we're at the bottom of the global value chain, even for services. And again, it's, been, it, it's always presented as the solution. And we are so anxious to attract capital of any kind that we forget that without ensuring decent conditions and good quality employment, it's actually a worthless task. Mm -hmm. It's excellent. Excellent. So um I'm going to ask DeLong to make his comment, who is a labor specialist. He is of um professor at University of the West Indies, but he was also deputy director for the Latin American and Economic Region of ECLAC. So mm -hmm. he's one of our esteemed <laughs> development economists in the region. Dylan, I'm going to ask um Richard to unmute you. And I have two questions in the chat. Actually, three, four, <laughs> as we go along. So can I say that I am going to ask those four questions to close off um, mm -hmm. the conversation after Dylan makes his comment? 
Thank you, Professor Gosh. Um, you, you know, I've spent two decades at ECLAC. We've wrestled with these very issues, some of which have been on the table for a long time. But I'm intrigued by your what you call your strategic engagement, the coming together of those persons with special interests, I, with particular interests. I think that's a very important point. And um, the, I think you're talking about the Ocampo Initiative in Latin America on tax cooperation. I don't know how much progress that has made. Uh, when I left there, there was a meeting in Colombia, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good initiative. Um, from the point of view of the Caribbean, I would say this. This idea of not paying your debt is, is no longer on the table. Um, there are ways of squeezing countries and locking you out of the financial system. It's not going to work. And at the global level, you, you should know that there is not going to be any cooperation. The IMF takes a certain view, which is it should be solved at the level of the private sector. The UN takes the view that it should be global and that those things will not converge. Um, but from the Caribbean point of view, I would say what, what, there are two things. What we face is these risks from shocks. And what we want is to be able to have a waiver on our debt repayment because we have to borrow for development reasons. We need a waiver. And so um, I think that hurricane clauses, um, two countries have been able to implement those, Grenada and um, uh, uh, Barbados. Uh, they need to be more generous. And what I would call state contingent instruments that allow us to have some uh, leeway when you are subject to continuous shocks, including the client, the, um, the, the COVID shock. So I think that um, this business of strategic uh, engagement and collaboration to me is a very powerful point. I've seen where it has worked, but remember the global South is not a, 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 a space where every interest is the same. So to look for global collaboration is always difficult, but strategic is important. And as I say, from the Caribbean point of view, what you want is to persuade the IMF, in particular, to support state contingent instruments. And there are many of them, GDP linked bonds and so on. The Caribbean has always paid its debt. Um, and lastly, I would say that um, I think that the, the lecture seemed to lean too, a little too much for me on this on the side of the pessimism. We have agency, and if we are coordinated, organized, and consistent, we should do better, notwithstanding clearly um, the fact that the, 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 the cards are stacked against us. So at the last two uh, uh, Cops, we were able to push through the damage and loss um, facility. We don't know how the money will be rolled out. We don't know if we'll get more of it. But that is the kind of strategic engagement that makes sense. And the Caribbean was very much a part of that. So I think that's a very powerful point. And to me, that is where the future is. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dylan, for your controversial inputs, <laughs> at least from my perspective. Professor Gosh, um, do you wish to have any comment on his comment? You know, I think that's a very valid point, and I do completely uh, sympathize with this. My point is really about how do you get the IMF to move? Because remember, the IMF is driven by the principal shareholders, the US and Europe. Yeah. And so how do you get them to move? And I don't think you can get them to move by just saying, oh, please be nice and please be rational. And, you know, it doesn't work. You have to show that you are systemically important because alone you're not. And we know that, you know, for systemically important things, they will do anything. If you look at Silicon Valley Bank in the US or Credit Suisse in Switzerland, they'll break all the rules. They won't, you know, everything goes. The minute they think you're systemically important, somehow, that your countries have to get together enough to be systemically important, which doesn't mean global coordination. It doesn't mean everybody, but it means a sufficiently large group of, you know, equally affected countries, shall we say. But I do take your point that there is a there are these other concerns as well. 
Yes, thank you so much, um, Professor Gotch. Um, how to show that we are systemically important. That's food for thought. Um, I think the Caribbean has been doing that by levering our, leveraging our spaces and our bodies and our histories to show that we matter and that we have been at the center of globalization and we continue to be at the center, even if it is in the context of climate catastrophe. So I wanted to ask these final questions, if you will permit me, um, Professor Gosh. All right, then. This is from Dr. Henke, who um, was one of um, the persons who introduced uh, our director at Silesis Mona. Um, he says there's a lot of activism on the ground by communities affected directly by extractivism and climate damaging activities. And I have to say that one of those activities includes my project on disaster capitalism in the Caribbean, um, which is funded by the Open Society Foundations. So how can these localized forms of resistance be strengthened and elevated? And that is the first question. Um, should I continue? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, that's a tough question though. <laughs> yes, let me try and remember that one yes all right then um so professor michael taylor who is also the dean of the faculty of science and technology at university of west indies and one of our most eminent climate scientists ask what about the move to establish legal culpability would you include in in your transfer of technology the building of climate science capacity for example in the area of attribution science, which will become more critical for making the case legally. Should we take those two and then do the last two? Yes, you know, on building up of local initiatives, I think they're absolutely crucial, but I think they can't be done without a broader national strategy. And let's face it, that has really been missing in most of our countries. We've all fallen, we've all drunk the neoliberal Kool-Aid. <laughs> and we all think that, you know, we don't need a national strategy. We don't need planning. We don't need to be thinking in the medium term. And we don't need public investment. You know, that's that's fundamentally underlying a lot of the still the basic economic policy framework. In that context, local initiatives can only remain local at best. I mean, it's a, it's already a miracle if they survive that they will not become transformative. So I'm really for, I'm, I'm in favor of a blending of the two in a way. Uh, to the question on climate science, yes. You know, um, I really have a problem with the way knowledge is colonized today. And I think the TRIPS regime is a major part of the colonizing of knowledge, but it's also the fact that the research questions and the methodologies are also determined by the North. And I think that's important, not just for social sciences, that's also important for the natural sciences. The very specific problems that are faced from climate change, et cetera, uh, the very localized problems, we, we often do not have the resources or the scientific and technical capacity to take those on. And we should be, in fact, cooperating with each other. Here I go again about South South, but we should be cooperating with others in other country, uh, countries that face these similar problems. Here, I want to take the example of the African CDC, uh, the African uh, Center for Disease Control, which in the period of the, of the pandemic really came out well. It, it was one of the few, I would say, successes of the pandemic in terms of just coordinating, coping, and trying to develop scientific capacities within the African continent on its own, recognizing that they have been basically abandoned by the global community and saying, well, we've got to do it ourselves. And they are now in the process of developing vaccines or doing much more genomic research and all kinds of other things that you, know, you can do if you get together. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So the last um, questions I'm going to field are from Anthony Gonzalez. Um, how is China different from the traditional Western countries in regards to climate imperialism? I was expecting that. <laughs> and um, from Jafaz Ali, given the climate externalities of extractive industries, should developing countries continue to seek short-term revenues from it? And then the I'm last- sorry, Can you just 
just say that again. The last yes. Yes. Given the climate externalities of extractive industries, should developing countries continue to seek short-term revenues from it? And um, one last question from Joel Walcott, who is from the University of Ghana. When we speak of climate reparations, are we only focused on financial compensation? How can climate reparations contribute to building mitigative capacities of effective countries? So those are our final questions, Professor Gosh, and then I will ask um, Dr. Bailey to give our vote of thanks. Okay, so I'm sorry, this is uh, embarrassing that I'm kind of forgetting the questions. I think if you can give me the keyword for the, the first, first question. China, how is China different China. from Western so, countries okay. with respect to climate imperialism? Okay, so I think China is only different in that it doesn't have a legacy of colonialism, okay? Which it definitely does not have a legacy of colonialism. In its current practices, is it hugely different? I would say no. It is very nationalist in its orientation. It is hugely determined to expand its own soft and hard power in different parts of the world. And it wants these minerals and this, and it wants to extract as much as it can. On the other hand, um, there is a brilliant African economist, Tandika Makandawire from Malawi. He, he was actually one of the finest development economists I have known. And he had this wonderful saying, he said, it's always better to have competing imperialists because <laughs> you can play one off against the other. You can actually, um, uh, you're always going to get worse terms if you're only dealing with one. So I think we could, we have to recognize that the very fact that China is there, exists, has geopolitical interests that are different from those of the Western bloc and um, has the finances that could support different, and the technologies that could support different kinds of things. Not that they are not going to share all of these wonderfully, they won't. But the very fact that they have them is already a counter. It already provides some leverage for, uh, for countries. So I think we have to see China in that light. The, the standard narrative of you know, Western media is, oh, China is so terrible, and it's all out to do terrible things, et cetera. Yes, that's partly true. But it is also true that China, frankly, is the only one that's done real debt relief. In the last four years, it has given $270 billion of debt relief. Quietly. It doesn't want to be part of the Paris Club. It doesn't want to be part of an IMF-led restructuring. And that's where all the sticking point is. And the very, as I said, I repeat, the very fact that it's there gives us additional bargaining power. The second question was on, oh dear, just a keyword again. <laughs> keyword. <laughs> um, uh climate externalities and oh, should yes. developing countries continue to seek revenues from extractive industries? Yeah, this, is, this is a really tough question because, you know, it is cert certainly the fossil fuels and that's another thing that the debts are doing. It's driving more and more countries into fossil fuel investment, which is really unfortunate. The very fact that you have debts that you don't, uh, that you need desperately for an exchange to repay so you will, you, uh, Chad is celebrating because it's discovered oil. You know, it's that kind of situation. And that's deeply unfortunate. It's hard to see a way out unless you get debt cancellation for these things. For other countries, I think there really has to be very long, hard thinking about the net benefits. And we don't do that. We simply say, oh, wow, now here is this oil or here is something, here is lithium and we can sell it and make quick money and so on. We need to have a long and careful consideration. And that's why I'm saying a planning framework. What are the net benefits for the economy over the next decade? And what are the net losses? And let's, let's put those together and then decide whether it's really worth it. I don't think enough of that is done. Okay. I overlooked a question from one of our colleagues, um, Dr. Elaine, who is our, or sorry, um, Dr. Dietrich Jones. And she said, do you have any thoughts on the export of labor within the context of potentially increasing climate-induced migration in a global environment characterized by increasingly restrictive migration regimes? So I just wanted to throw that out um, as our very, very last question. Yeah, um, you know, 
this is again a very interesting question because not Europe and not the US, but Europe is in a real bind because it has an aging population. It needs more migration for its workforce. And yet it is getting progressively anti migration. It is terrified by the possibility of climate induced migration. And yes, we're going to see more and more barriers. I think politically, the signs are all there that there are going to be more and more, frankly, racist barriers to migration even though the economic needs are going to make migration more and more required, in migration required for many of these countries. So it is a complex situation, which it's hard to know exactly how to play out. To rely on that as a development strategy is problematic. Let's face it, the countries that have relied on it, Philippines, Sri Lanka, now for 25 years, they have been really massively exporting labor, particularly women's labor in reproductive industries and care work, et cetera, domestic workers and nurses and so on. It hasn't led to a transformation of the economy. So yes, it gives you some foreign exchange relief, but unless you're able to do something with that foreign exchange, it doesn't solve your dilemma, development dilemma. So I, I, I'm a little wary of seeing that as any kind of a solution. Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Gosh. I know there are other questions. One last one that was made, but it, it was addressed in the presentation in relationship to your advocacy for food sovereignty. So I saw your comment, um, um, Dr. Brathwaite, I'm not ignoring you, but um, perhaps you didn't catch the, the, the plug that um, Professor Gosh made for food sovereignty as a strategy moving forward. Um, so it just leaves me... Um, my pleasure now to invite Dr. Bailey to um, take the closing remarks and thank you so much for your indulgence with the time that you've given the extra time that you've afforded to us to to air all the questions that were raised and to allow for comments as well. So Dr. Bailey, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sobo. And good morning, good evening again, everyone. Prof Ghosh, thank you very much. We are particularly grateful um, and we greatly appreciate the time that you've shared with us and the insights uh, in relation to all of the various topics as mentioned in the chat and as Dr. Northover has so ably chaired and guided um, relating to the development project. Um, and the specific issues relating to the transfer of green technologies, labor, employment, climate imperialism, and the, the wealth of information that has been shared. We thank the audience for your participation, your questions, your comments. Uh, we thank Dr. Northover for chairing uh, and coordinating the session, and Dr. Holga Henke for the opening remarks and pointing us as well to some of the um, comments that have been shared by a Salisa's professorial fellow, Prof. Figaro. Uh, Prof. Marshall, we also thank you for highlighting Prof. Gauche's role uh, and uh, as a leading international development economist and her work in that space as well. And we thank the coordinating team, uh, everyone who has been organizing, uh, Mr. Richard Leach for the technical direction and for everyone's participation. Uh, in the chat, I will share a link to a collection of some of Prof. Gauche's articles in the Gleano. Um, it's always very interesting to read uh, a number of the articles that she has been sharing on this topic and in relation as well to the green, um, to areas relating to the green technology transfer, labor and employment, and particularly uh, as well in terms of the definitions of climate finance and uh, definitions relating to data collection um, and a range of, of areas. So again, we thank you. Um, and uh, it's you so been a much. pleasure it's celebrating the search. Yes. And I just like, privilege for us uh, to, 
I just wanted to make one final <laughs> plug that we have our annual conference coming up in May, May 1 to 3. We'll be looking at the issue from translating thought to action, decolonial equity and justice in the Caribbean. So please go to our website, Salises. Um, UE and you will be able to find information on that. And I think Dr. Henke can drop the the um website link for those of you who are interested and who want to participate. Professor Gosh, you're always welcome to every activity that we have in <laughs> in the Caribbean from now on. You are a sister <laughs> in our so much. I would and love we to look forward you to continue our relationship with you in, in in other ways if you aren't able to make our conference. Lovely. Thank you so much. I really do look Thank forward you. to meeting you in person sometime. It's been a great and pleasure. One additional, it really in relation to Professor Gosh had also mentioned the vaccine um, and the anti-vaccine uh, initiatives and one of the Salises lectures coming up uh, in partnership with FMS and FSP relates to Cuba's work in this area. So you are also welcome to join and share as well. Thank and you. So we thank everyone. Over to, to Dr. North over and thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone. It was brilliant. It was exciting. It was what we needed to hear in the Caribbean. <laughs> what good you. as we say in Jamaica. <laughs> Be well. <laughs> Wonderful. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.